Hi, my name is Autumn Dixon, and this week is April 4th through the 10th, and we are in Exodus 14 through 17. Now, if you prefer to receive your Come Follow Me lesson in a different medium, I post information about my blog and my podcast in the description below my videos. So this week, we are covering a couple of different topics, but one of the biggest topics and most familiar topics is that of Moses parting the Red Sea to save the Israelites from the Egyptians. Now, this is an immense display of power power from the God of Israel. And the order in which some of the events occur is so significant because it teaches us something really, really incredible about Moses. So, the order of events that I want to talk about. Number one, Pharaoh decides that he regrets letting the Israelites go, and so he gathers up his army. They start pursuing the Israelites. The Israelites are leaving, and they look up. They see the Egyptians pursuing them, and they become quite terrified, and they turn to Moses, and they said, didn't we tell you to leave us alone in the land of Egypt to just leave us be? Because it's better that we are serving the Egyptians than us dying by the hand of the Egyptians out here. And this is actually where I want to start reading. So this is Exodus chapter 14 and it's verses 13 through 16. And then it says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and he shall hold, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, what, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Now, the order here is extremely significant. And the reason that I say that is because if you pay attention to when Moses actually encouraged the Israelites, it happens before the Lord encourages Moses. So the Israelites are like, we're so afraid we see Pharaoh. And Moses is like, stop it. The Lord is going to fight your battles and you're going to hold your peace. And then the Lord comes forward and he was like, don't look at me. Tell the Israelites to move forward and the sea is going to part, right? Hold up your staff. Moses <laughs> had the faith before he even knew what was going to happen. He didn't even turn to the Lord and say, hey, are you going to save us, right? He had so much faith, he knew the miracle was coming, even though he didn't quite know what it was. Now, we've looked at their reactions. We've compared the reaction of the Israelites and Moses, right? The Israelites looked up, they were super afraid. And then there was Moses, who was very faithful. Now, the Israelites had just witnessed a ton of terrible miracles occurring in the land of Egypt. Lots of horrible plagues <laughs> from the God of Israel. They had just performed this ritual that they had been taught. And this ritual had saved their firstborn, firstborn sons, even though they probably didn't fully understand what that ritual was pointing to or, towards, which was the sacrifice of the Savior. They had just witnessed all of this incredible power from the God of Israel, and they witnessed it happening through Moses. However, it wasn't enough, right? They were still really scared when they saw the Egyptians coming. Now compare that to Moses' reaction, and think about, think about the situation that Moses is in right now, right? He just called down all these terrible plagues upon the Egyptians through the power of the Lord, and he is the leader of these people who find themselves cornered against the Red Sea, right? So it's one thing if I have found myself cornered in life. I've been trying to follow the Lord and all of a sudden I find myself backed up into a corner and everything seems really, really terrible. It is quite another thing when you are leading a ridiculous amount of people and everybody is now in trouble. Moses didn't turn around and shake his hands at the fist like, shake his hand, fist at heaven and is like, don't you know that they're counting on me? Like, why did you lead me to lead them here to the Red Sea where we're all going to be killed by the Egyptians, right? No, instead, Moses is like, the Lord is going to fight your battles. And that is also significant to me, right? <laughs> Moses is like, the Lord is going to fight for you. And I think that that's significant because the Lord doesn't actually fight. 
for the Israelites, right? There's no battle. Instead, he parts the Red Sea, Israelites go through, water swallows up the Egyptians. And I think that this is significant because I'm picturing this happening in real time. We have Moses and he sees the Egyptians coming and he's like, I've been here before. The Lord is about to work an incredible miracle. I don't know how we're going to win this battle, but we're going to win this battle. And the Lord is going to fight these Egyptians and we're going to be fine, right? But the Lord's like, yes, Moses, I'm going to show up, but I'm not fighting. In, fa in fact, you're going to stick up your staff and there's the water's going to part. That's actually how you're going to escape, <laughs> right? Moses didn't actually know what was going to occur. He didn't know what miracle was coming. The Lord hadn't even told him that a miracle was coming. Moses just had faith and knew that something was going to be coming. <laughs> now, how do we get to that point? When we find ourselves cornered against the Red Sea, enemies closing in on all sides, how do we get to the point where we don't even have to turn to the Lord anymore and be like, hey, remember me? <laughs> I'm really struggling here. Are you aware of me? Do you actually love me? How do we get to the point where we're like Moses and we find ourselves in that situation and we're like, okay, this is when the Lord steps in. And I know that the Lord's going to step in. And I don't have to be scared of the sea on one side or the enemies on the other side because I know that this is going to work out. How do we get to that same arena of faith that Moses has? Now we've compared, like I said, we've compared the reactions of Moses and the Israelites. But for a second, I want to compare the situations, the life situations, the life perspectives of the Israelites versus Moses. And this is really, really important because we're going to find something here that's going to help us follow the path of Moses so that we can gain faith like Moses. So let's look at their their situations, where they came from. So the Israelites, <laughs> all that they have known of life is slavery and dehumanization and severe, heavy labor and beatings. And if one of them dies, it's not a big deal. And the Egyptians can kill them whenever they want, right? This is, <sighs> it's tragic, right? And it probably gave them a lot of mental health issues. <laughs> we'll just say that. Lots of PTSD, probably. There, and when Moses even comes and Moses is like, hey, I'm going to save you guys, their life gets harder for a little bit, right? They haven't had that breath of fresh air where they feel like they're going to be saved. Combine this with the fact that their knowledge of God or the concept of God is coming from Egypt, right? So they have spent all this time enslaved to the Egyptians. They've probably become very distant from this God of Israel. They probably don't really know anything about him. What they know of the concept of God is what they have learned from the Egyptians. And the Egyptians believe in gods that had lots of power, but they also had limitations. And they also had foibles. And they had these personalities, right, where they... I mean, the humans certainly weren't their children. <laughs> the Egyptians could sacrifice and make all of these, like, I guess, offerings to these gods, but the gods didn't have any particular affection for them, not like the god that we believe in. So this is their concept of God. This is the concept of what Israelites believe that God is. So they have experienced, and they watched all these plagues happen, and they're like, okay, this god has a lot of power, but... Maybe they haven't been taught that God is all-powerful. And even if they have been taught that God is all-powerful, why would they believe that this God cares about them, right? That they are his children. I can't imagine that Moses had a ton of time to sit down and teach them the missionary lessons, right? <laughs> teach them the missionary discussions. The God of Israel is completely foreign to them. Of course, they were terrified when they saw the Egyptians coming. It would be insane of us to to expect that kind of belief from them <laughs> why on earth would they all of a sudden just have that faith like even if you <laughs> i mean like think about the experiences that they've had with god the god of israel they have seen this god rain down terrible plagues <laughs> like what would you think of that god even if it's raining down on your enemies mostly i would just be afraid of him now let's look at moses <laughs> so moses grew up in the palace. He likely was not severely beaten and he wasn't enslaved. He probably didn't have to perform super heavy labor. He did go through a trial where he had to leave the only home he had ever known in the palace 
but he found himself in the home of Jethro, probably where he was receiving gospel teachings, right? He received the priesthood. I can only imagine that he was being taught about the God of Israel and who the God of Israel was and who he was. Even before he received his calling as a prophet, he was probably learning about who he was as a child of God, right? He was learning about the power of God, but he was experiencing the goodness of God. And then he receives his calling. He goes to Egypt. All of these incredible miracles are performed. He has received a testimony that the God that he believes in is all powerful and loves him, right? <laughs> Moses has received an immense head start and compared to the rest of the Israelites. On top of this, Moses has also learned that miracles often arise from trials. So he had this really big trial where he left this palace that he'd grown up with, grown up in. He left the, the princess to Pharaoh, right? Who was the mother that he had known. He left all of these things behind. He kind of sacrificed all of the comforts that he had known growing up. And he probably mourned that. It was not easy, I'm sure. <laughs> he probably wondered if he did a right thing defending one of the Israelites. But as he found himself in the home of Jethro, where he found his wife, and he found God, and he had these incredible spiritual experiences, he was able to see that through this trial that he had experienced, he was able to come out on the other side and receive miracles beyond his wildest dreams, right? Like that it was so much better on the other side of that trial. And he had come to that point where he was grateful that that trial had occurred because it led him to where he was. So like I said, Moses had a big head start on these poor Israelites who had ever only known slavery and that the Egyptians could just kill their sons whenever they wanted or could beat them and there would be no repercussions, right? Moses had this huge head start and Moses had this incredible faith when they came to the Red Sea. So what do we need? What can we learn from Moses' life where we can, I guess, replicate those kinds of experiences and be able to build the kind of faith that Moses has? Well, I come up with this incredibly simplified formula, very simplified. It's probably much more detailed, I guess, much more individualized, right, for each of us but kind of a simplified formula for how we achieve the kind of faith that Moses has. Number one, we need, there's four ingredients. Number one, we need a doctrinal foundation of our, heaven, of our Heavenly Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Moses received this in the home of Jethro. He learned about God and he learned about how he was special to God and how he was important to God. You'll have to excuse me if you hear my daughter in the background trying to fall asleep. <laughs> So Moses had received this doctrinal foundation of God. The Israelites, on the other hand, <laughs> had not received this doctrinal foundation. I want you to imagine being an Israelite and you see all of these really scary, terrible things happening, right? Even though it's happening to your enemies, really scary things happening. I want you to imagine how the perspective the Israelites might have changed if they had any kind of doctrinal foundation of the Lord, right? If they saw all of these plagues coming down on the Egyptians and they knew it was because there was a Lord in heaven who loved them and that this heavenly father and this savior was trying to save them from the hands of the Egyptians or if they had a deeper testimony of that, I guess. I guess Moses had told them to an extent that he was trying to save them. But if they had a deeper testimony of that, how might it have changed their perspective as they watched these plagues go down? How might they have felt different as they watched these firstborn sons of these Egyptians just die, would their perspective have been a little less scared if they knew about the plan of salvation? <laughs> if they knew that someday there would be an ultimate sacrifice by a firstborn son who would save all of humanity, not just the Israelites, but the Egyptians too, that he would save everybody who was willing to come unto him. How might it have changed this entire experience for them? Would it have been a little less scary as they watched people dying? <laughs> would it have been a little less scary if they knew that eventually there would be a resurrection of everybody, that death was not the end? If they had any kind of a doctrinal foundation, I feel like it would have changed the experience that they went through. Just like it does for in our lives, right? If when you have a, a, a doctrinal foundation of why we're here on earth, 
of what we're supposed to be doing while we're here and where we're going. It makes it so much easier to, to see life for what it is. So number one, it very much helps, <laughs> helps a lot to have a doctrinal foundation of our Heavenly Father and our Savior Jesus Christ. But that is not enough. It's not enough. You also need experiences, personal experiences, multiple experiences with the power of the Lord. And you need personal experiences and multiple experiences of the goodness of the Lord. And then the last one that I want to talk about is you need multiple, multiple experiences of trials becoming miracles, right? In order to build up this kind of faith that Moses had when he ran into a new trial, when he ran into a new dead end. So I talked a little bit about this doctrinal foundation and how your perspective of everything that you're going through can shift when you have just a little bit of a testimony of who Jesus Christ is. The second two kind of go together, those personal experiences and those multiple experiences of the power and the goodness of God, right? So you can receive a testimony that God is real and that he loves you. You can kind of receive a testimony of that. But until you've tasted of it over and over and over again, <laughs> you don't really, really know, right? Even it, I've always found it interesting how often in the church we emphasize this idea of, oh, go home, kneel down, and pray and receive a testimony that he loves you. I'm not hating on that experience at all, right? Like, I think that those steps are so, so important, but they are insufficient as one little step right? This is, it needs to be a continual conversation, a continual experience with the Lord to fully understand how much he loves you and to be able to place weight on that emotional weight, to place spiritual weight on this idea that he loves you. It is going to take a lot of prayer and a lot of experience with how much he loves you, with how powerful he is, right? These Israelites had no idea that there was this God who was all powerful, who could do anything, who could split the earth in half whenever he wanted, right? They didn't have a concept of that. If you can have a concept of God and that he is so powerful, when you come to the Red Sea, the Red Sea is not scary. The armies of the world are not scary. Not when you really, really understand who God is and how powerful he is. And not only how powerful he is, but how much he loves you and how important you are to him. You can't, it's not enough to just know the power of the Lord, right? Because the Israelites had seen how powerful God is. They had begun to taste of how really powerful this God of Israel was. But I imagine that their experience with the goodness of God was a little more limited just because of their life experiences. And so it's really, really important <laughs> to have multiple experiences with that. It also helps, I guess, when you have a foundation to work with at home, right? It's There's a reason that Heavenly Father wanted us to come to earth in whole families with parents who love us and who teach us to love each other. It's because when you have parents who love you, not even perfect parents, but when you have parents who love you, it sets you up to be able to more fully comprehend a heavenly father who loves you. Now, if you did not find yourself growing up in one of those kinds of homes, it doesn't mean that you are doomed to forever be without that experience of the Lord's goodness, right? You can still come to experience him. It might be a little more difficult for you, but that just means you're going to be that much stronger when you figure it out. <laughs> Don't put a ton of pressure on yourself to just have faith immediately. And I always have to be perfect for this God of Israel, right? Allow yourself to get to know the God of Israel, to have experiences with him, to let him show you who he is and how powerful he is and how much he loves you. Allow him to show himself to you. Now, last ingredient. So the last ingredient is that miracles can come from trials. So Moses had a little bit of an experience with this, or at least we know of one experience where he had with this, where he had to leave behind the only home he had known. But 
After mourning that and after going through that hard thing, he found himself in the home of Jethro, where he was able to learn about the God of Israel. And he was able to find his wife and receive the priesthood and start living the gospel. He was able to personally experience how hard things can turn into incredible things. Now, Israelites probably had a much more limited experience with this kind of thing. They had lived their entire lives in slavery. When you have had the opportunity to go, <laughs> opportunity is such an interesting word for this, but when you've had the opportunity to go through many trials in your life, they start to look familiar. When you hit Red Sea after Red Sea after Red Sea, eventually you start to recognize it and you're like, hey, this is when the Lord steps in. You no longer have to turn to the Lord and be like, hey, do you still remember me? I have enemies all around me and I'm really, really scared. Don't you even care about me? Can you really do everything that you say you're going to be able to do? Eventually, you've run into enough Red Seas and you've had enough experiences with the Lord and you have come to know him fully enough that you don't even have to ask. Just like Moses didn't ask, right? He got to the Red Sea, and when the hard thing happened, he didn't say, hey, don't you know we're still here? And that I'm supposed to be leading these people away from Egypt. Remember how you told me to do that? He didn't have to do that because he'd had enough experience with the Lord. He had come to, the Lord, come to know the Lord enough that he didn't have to ask. He knew it was going to happen. He trusted it. It happened enough and he felt close enough to the Lord that he trusted the Lord. Coming to the Lord to know the Lord is like coming to know anybody except he happens to be perfect and all powerful and loves you perfectly. When you have these multiple experiences, I think sometimes we put all this pressure on ourselves to just trust him immediately and to believe in him immediately. But the Lord doesn't mind if we take our time in getting to know him, right? When you look at, when you continue reading in these chapters, the Israelites like go through all these wonderful miracles. They go through the plagues. They're saved in the Red Sea. And then they're like, yo, Moses, you're going to let us starve. And <laughs> even though they're really sassy about it, the Lord is like, here's some manna, even though you have the spiritual capacity of a two-year-old and <laughs> I deserve a little more gratitude than this. Here's some manna for you because I know that you're still spiritually young. The Lord does not get angry at us for being spiritually young. He allows that growth period in which we get to test him too. He's testing us, but he allows us to test him, to get to know him, to come to taste of his goodness, to come to taste of his power and his ability to save us. The kind of faith that Moses has built up, <laughs> for most of us, or at least for me, it takes, honestly, it'll probably take me a lifetime to be able to hit that point to where I run into the next trial and I'm like, I've been here before and I know the Lord's going to show up because he has showed up every other time, just like he said he would. Even though in the beginning, I didn't know how it was going to happen. In the beginning, I didn't know that the sea would be parted. I know now because I've seen it happen enough times in my life. I trust it because it happens every single time because that is who the Lord is. And if you are sitting there asking me like, why hasn't it happened for me? <laughs> it's because the Red Sea has not parted yet, but it will. It always does. Hold on, wait long enough. It will part and it will part at the perfect moment and you'll be able to look back and it'll be that faith building experience that you want. And then when you hit the next Red Sea, you'll be a little bit more prepared. Like, hey, I've been here before. I know what happens next. And when you reach that point to where you're no longer having to constantly turn around, like, are you still there? Right. I just had a picture in my head of my one of my daughters who tends to be shy sometimes when we go somewhere. I swear she's always like looking back like, you didn't abandon me, mom, right? Like, you're still here, mom, right? You're still here, mom. There will come a point when she knows I'm not going to abandon her. And so she won't feel like she needs to keep looking for me. It's the same with our Heavenly Father. There will come a point where we don't have to keep looking to see if he's abandoned us or if, or asking whether he has the power to deliver, deliver us. There will come a point when we have reached that kind of faith that Moses had, 
where we turn around and we say, no, I know what happens next because it has happened every other time. And when we reach that faith, that is the kind of faith that parts the Red Sea, where you see that big of a miracle, where you know something is going to happen even though you can't see it yet. I am grateful for my Savior who is patient with my spiritual immaturity and wants me to get to know him. He's not going to punish me for being scared in trials or for not being at the faith of Moses yet, right? He is going to allow me to have time to get to know him because he loves me. And he is so much more patient with me than I am with my own children. <laughs> He's going to give me that time. I'm grateful for the scriptures and what they can teach us about our own experiences with the Savior. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.